Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us today on Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. I'm David Yost, and here with Karen Rexroad this morning. Good morning. Great to have you back again. Karen and I were here last week, and so I uh, hope some of our regular viewers kind of know where we're coming from. But uh, so what's in store for us today? So we're going to talk about fall flowers and even late season flowers, like the ones for August, the dog days of August. So we have a lot of examples and a lot of lovely, lovely photographs to show you. So. Yeah, it'll be another fun day. All right, just like we were saying yesterday, people have this assumption or whatever yeah. that, oh, there's, you know, late summer, you know, yeah. things are all done, there's nothing blooming, and we were just staying in the perennial section looking surrounded yeah. with color every place, every place you turn yeah. your head. it's beautiful. Yeah, so you need to come into the garden center and check it out and see it for yourself yeah. there. Uh, well, and we'll also be taking phone calls at the end of the program. It's been a while since we've been able to do that. Everybody's been coming and going on vacation, but uh, we're back with the full crew now, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. And that's going to be in the last two segments of our show. So if you have any questions or want to clarify anything we talk about today, questions about your garden, or share some of your own, exper your own experiences, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, the other thing before we really get going here, I want to give everybody a reminder that our fall seminar series will be starting soon on September 6th. Uh, this is a copy of the brochure that's giving the list of the full uh, schedule coming up. So they start in September, and these continue to run well past um, into the holidays. So mm -hmm. this even goes into the decorating season through Christmas and right. such. Uh, Karen and I are both on here for giving yeah. several presentations. Starting soon. Yeah, and this is always fantastic. You know, we love talking to you on the show, but when you come to seminars, we can meet you face to face. Uh, it has time to go into more detail. That type of thing. So, if you're on our mailing list, uh, these just get, are hot off the press, and it may be another week or so before they actually arrive. So, be watching your mailbox to receive them there. Uh, if you're not on the mailing list, you might want to stop by the garden center and pick one up. And of course, on our website, you can find the full list of selection there, and they're all free. Right. Uh, don't, we just just show up and everything, and have a good time. Right. So that's that's something to look forward to as well. But uh, I think what we're going to do today, like I said, there's just color every place when you mm -hmm. go around the garden center. And this is true in the tree section, the shrub section, the annuals, the perennials, and right. everything. Uh, but we're going to start out there. So I think a few flowers that may not be as familiar to all of you as, uh, as some. And Karen's going to start out showing us a couple, maybe these sort of less familiar, underrecognized, underused blossoms that you would find right now. Right, and this is this is Simisifuga, which ha has a name change to Actea, but rarely does anybody really use that. Uh, Simisifuga is really for shade. Uh, it's tall, it's fragrant, it's lovely. Uh, it's a native, um, and it's just one of the great flowers because it blooms at such you know a wonderful time when it seems like there's a real ebb in the shade garden. So it's it's just a really good plant, and we do have a photograph of a combination with Simisifuga and the hardy begonia in our next photograph. And this was uh, taken at the gardens that I work at, Oak Hill, and you can see the Simisifuga, how tall it is in the background, with the begonia in the foreground. And if you look there to your right, you'll see this little patch of poison ivy, which <laughs> I'm not fond of poison ivy, so uh, it, it takes great effort for me to plant to, to get it out of there. But what a lovely sight for late in the summer. The begonias have just begun. The Simisifuga will be right after that. So this is just great to have in your shade garden for this time of year. Yeah, and I love the foliage in those begonias too. I mean, it's mm -hmm. gorgeous flowers, but the foliage has that sort of rough textured look, the red yeah. underside. And again, make sure everybody knows that this is a perennial form of begonia. A lot of times I think we're just thinking of the annuals. Right, and it comes in white and pink. Um, both colors great for the shade gardener. White sometimes just because it's a shady, darker spot. But it is, it's a begonia. So people do um, sometimes get surprised at the fact that we have a begonia that is a perennial and hardy. Yeah, no, I, all the time I'm asking, I get customers who are looking for something that can give them flowers and shade. Uh, just when we say shade, sort of this bright dappled light environment, right. or yeah. can we push that into heavy shade conditions. You know, it depends on the canopy as far as what's providing the shade. If it's a light canopy or a kind of open canopy, that works all right. If it's due east, that's that's like ideal. 
to have an open east exposure without any obstruction at all. Uh, in fact, that's my absolute favorite exposure because then the sun is just that right amount of sun to keep things flowering, but not too much to sort of burn them out in our summer. So morning sun, cool sun is the best. Good. So that's one to try if you look for light color and yep. shade. Yep. Now the next flower you've got in here is one that I've got to tell you, I've, I've never seen it before. It's not one that I'm familiar with. Well, it's a, it's a biennial. Angelica gigas, and you can buy it. We do have one-year-old plants at Merrifield at Fair Oaks right now. The interesting thing is how the the flower bud comes literally out of the petiole. It like the petiole, the st the stem forms like a spoon, uh, at which holds the bud, which then pops up. So as a biennial plant goes, it will bloom the second year. So what we're selling are plants that are one year old that bloom next year. Then you allow the seed to fall and then it is uh, something that will sprout and bloom in its second year. It's more for sun, although it can take a very high shade. And it's a really intriguing plant and it's great for August. It's just one of those, you know, surprise August flowers. It's just so, you know, it's just beautiful. And I know some of the angelicas get pretty big. What's yeah, no, the height's about three feet, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's only about maybe three feet around. So it's nice, and it has dark, nice dark, darkish foliage and those beautiful dark stems. Well, it's great, Karen. You always bring some new plants to yeah. the to the table, things that's that I'm not familiar that's with. That's my so. job. <laughs> yeah, a, you've already. Every time I do a show, I'm sort of making a list of what I'm going to plant next year for oh, my good. garden. Oh, good. Good. And then this is Allium Millennium. So Millennium is from the famous hybridizer of onions called the Onion Man, Mark McDonough. And whenever he brings something to the plate, as in a new plant that is mass marketed, it is splendid, wonderful, have to have it. And so this plant was brand new last year and I put it in my garden and it's been absolutely fabulous. It's been blooming for two months. It's not a true bulb. It's low, about 20 inches, and just remarkable. Butterflies love it. The bees love it. Uh, it's just it's just a great plant, and um, I would encourage everybody to get it. Now, we are sold out, I will tell you, at the Fair Oaks store. Put it on your have-to-have list, and we will, you know, we will be getting them back in. But boy, oh boy, is this a great plant for sun. Great. And then I think we've got one more picture here before we go to commercial. Which has that allium in, the con in a container at Merrifield. Um, so you see, it's even good for containers. It blooms so long. It's really a great plant. So I encourage everybody to, to again, put that on your must-get list. And you think we'll get more of those before the end of the season? I, that's the plan. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yes. Excellent. We're working on it. Right. Yeah, because you were showing that to me right before we sold out, and that is a gorgeous little uh -huh. flower. Well, in the first year, it's just you need it to have it in your garden for a year and then have it in another year so that, you know, you can really see the potential because it just gets better and better. It's a wonderful plant. Excellent. So. Well, we're going to have to take a little commercial break, but uh, stick with us. and we come back, we've got more flowers for the late summer garden. Back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. If you're just joining us, Karen's here today sharing mm -hmm. some uh, flowers for the late summer, early fall garden. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just showing us some fantastic, kind of new and interesting varieties. Now you're going to introduce us to, I know, what, yes. one of your many favorite groups of plants. Yes, I have many kinds of gardens because I don't know how to like give one up. And then I always find something I need more of, so I have to build another garden. But anyway, I'm, I'm excited today to be able to talk about the dahlias. Kelvin floodlight, what an incredible plant. So, so what I want to say about dahlias is a couple things. If you have failed with dahlias, don't dis get discouraged because we live in a zone or at least in a climate that's a little hotter than they want. So you have to make sure that you get the right ones and then you have to make sure that you get the right place. So the right place would be where it's partial sun. And <clears throat> for me, it was just an opening to the south that I finally figured out was right, but it could be due east. It could be just a smidge west, you know, enough to make them bloom, but not get too hot. So this one is one of those super wonderful heat tolerant varieties. Uh, I've got it there with a ruler, but it's been sitting here, you know, with me up here and you'll be able to see it as we as we come back to 
there we go. Look at the size of this. You know, the ruler just doesn't do it justice. Is that incredible or what? So, like so many of these really large ones, they are um, so spectacular that they might not be absolutely fabulous for arrangements, floral arrangements. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of the others, but well, it uh, doesn't you know, need a floral arrangement. It, it, it's just, all by itself. Exactly. Yes. That's just a single stem flower and right when, there. And when I bring these into work and I lay it on the table, people have to come up and, and just say, "Is it real?" I mean, they just don't even believe it's real. Yeah. Now, so, can I just <clears> I'm, I'm again yeah. interrupt you, but how long as a cut flower would you expect that to last? Oh, you'd be you'd be surprised. Um, it's a few days. I mean, yeah. I'm always surprised at how, I mean, it might even be a week. If you cut it earlier, you know, this one is, is sort of towards the end. But what I want to say is we do not, so we don't have these plants for sale. These are tender tubers or sometimes hardy, depending on our winters. And when you do buy them, you're going to get them in the spring and you're going to come in and you're going to find the boxes with the tubers in them. But the thing that the box doesn't say is the heat tolerance. And that's so important for us because of where we live. So I suggest you do a little bit of homework, which I like to use the Georgia Dahlia Society's list, because of course Georgia is much warmer than we are, to decipher which ones would be the best based on what color you want, what, what size, what color, you know, even style type flower. And it's a great, very comprehensive list. And so I use that. And uh, I, ba I go then and I, you know, look for just those varieties because, like I said, when you come in and you buy them, it's not going to say on the box that it's heat tolerant. So uh, that's what I did a couple years ago, and I've been very happy with the results. And this one is definitely just a stunning one of the very best, but we do have a few others to show you. Uh, look at that little bug crawling on it right now. It's on, sh on TV. <laughs> oh, our star coming out of the, for, the, yes. for the show. <laughs> so this is another one which is almost as big as Kelvin Floodlight called Blue Bayou, and it's just fabulous. This is my first year with this one, and so I really do, do like it, and it's a great, beautiful, beautiful color. Most of them that we uh, can expect to work well for us in our climate with the heat are smaller flowering. So both Kelvin Floodlight and Blue Bayou are wonderful because they're larger flowering. But when we get into some of the smaller flowering varieties, we have Bloodstone, which is next. Uh, it's a red, a lovely red, and I do have some of them up here in a vase, which we'll look at. So Bloodstone is one, um, and it's a little better for cutting because the stem is a little longer. Uh, then we also have a bunch of series of which one of the series is Mystic, which is our next slide, which shows you um, the Mystics come in different colors, but what they're doing with so many of these are they're, they're breeding in these dark leaves, so you get this lovely yellow light color or even an orange with a dark leaf as a base. So these are generally sold as live plants. When you come into the nursery in the spring, you're going to find a series. And every year there's this new series based on heat tolerance uh, that you can find. Mystic is one. Um, and then the next one is a single one called Claire de Lune, which is another lovely yellow, just beautiful flower, fabulous for cutting, long stem, you know, really, really a delightful little um, dahlia that's, that's smaller than the, the first two that I showed you. And then as far as a series goes, we have the Happy Days. So next we have Happy Days, and this one is called Kiss. And this again has the dark foliage, you know, just beautiful, beautiful flowers. Uh, relatively good for cutting with a, with a decent uh, stem length. Uh, and then we've had in the past, we're gonna show you Bishop of Landaff. And Bishop of Landaff has been around, I would say, every bit of 15 years. Dark foliage, red flowers, one of the very first ones that was really sort of introduced as a heat tolerant variety. Very, very nice in the garden. Uh, I actually have it in my black garden and we did a show on the black garden uh, quite a bit ago and it's just, it's just a great variety. So then I wanted to talk a little bit about how to store them and dig them as far as being able to ensure that you'll have them for the next year. and. Some people in the past, a lot of people have done the whole layering in a container with peat, digging up the big tubers and layering them between layers of peat and then putting them in sort of a cool environment. But there's a new way where you use, and I would write this down, eight parts vermiculite to two parts sulfur. And this is like a uh, dust that you then put in a bag and shake the tubers so that they're coated and then you can store them by just wrapping them in plastic wrap and putting masking tape on the plastic wrap to say what the variety is. 
Now, normally, we have winters that can be relatively mild and we don't have a problem with them wintering over, but I am always unsure whether it's going to be a bad winter or not, so I will dig half and leave half. Uh, and so when you dig them, you want them to dry out very well, then you want to coat them with the mix, and this is a picture of what they'll sort of look like. They'll be kind of yellow from the sulfur, then you will let that dry out again, and then you will do the wrapping and storage, and a cool place is best. But I do find that, like last winter, I lost all my dahlias in the ground, so it was wise of me to dig up and take some and, and at least have them so I was, you know, sure that I would have them for this year. All right, now, Karen, you've mentioned several times about the heat tolerance. I'm just guessing that with the mild weather we've had this summer, yeah. are they, like, exploding this, and doing really great this, this year? This has been a great summer. Yeah. Really, it has been a right. good summer for dahlias. I'm very happy with my dahlia patch. Yeah. And I haven't, I haven't really taken the time to grow dahlias very much, but I understand mm -hmm. that it's soil preparation. I know you're talking about exposure, but it's the importance of drainage and well-prepared yeah, soil. Yeah, you know, I just have them in the garden bed where it's relatively rich. There's a lot of compost, and it's, you know, it's been worked up, and it's a regular garden bed. It's not clay. It's not heavy soil. And I don't worry so much about the drainage. In fact, I water them quite a bit during the summer months to get these nice big flowers. Okay. So they're, they're easy. Fantastic. Well, like I said, they're blooming now, yeah. and you buy the tubers next spring. So, again, mm -hmm. put that on your list. You've, you've got everybody working on their list now. All right. <laughs> it's getting longer. Exactly. <laughs> All right. We're going to take a little commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to continue adding on to that must-have list. Karen and I have been here showing off some great flowers mm -hmm. for this time of yes. year and as we look forward. And I always feel like we're these, what I call transition times in yes, the garden here. Definitely. When we're sort of, you know, that summer season's coming to a close, the fall season's just ahead. To me, these are always critical times in the garden as yeah. far as planning and looking ahead. Yeah, I mean, the fall season is an explosion. It's another secondary explosion like spring, but there is that whole period before that. So we have great opportunities to have great flowers, and we should take advantage of it. Right, and of course, one of the traditional yeah. ones that, um, mm -hmm. is, that everybody's probably familiar with, but, could, but they deserve that reputation, are the chrysanthemums. Right. Yeah, now this is an example. We sell uh, chrysanthemums. They just started coming into the garden center this week. Uh, so what you're seeing there, these are in our annual section. These are not always completely reliably winter hardy. But my point is they're just, just now starting to come into color, and I think it's a great time to come in and buy them because you get to enjoy the entire bloom season. I love to pick them out when, when they're in bud, the exact, buds are yes, tight. You can tight. Just, just see what color you're getting, and then you get to enjoy the full blooming season on them. Yep. No, these are the cushion mums, and they've been hybridized, um, you know, to the point of you can get unbelievable colors and... Um, choices in the types of flowers and so we're going to talk a little bit about the Korean moms which is what I've always called them um, that are that are things you don't need to pinch like these these need to be pinched so one of them is in this photograph is chrysanthemum Sheffield and that's uh, the pink flowering daisy chrysanthemum in there planted amongst a whole lot of fountain grass and that is a is a mix. I did this for a for a customer of mine, where we actually planted 200 fountain grasses and interspersed them randomly with Sheffield, pink Sheffield is is how you usually find it uh, sold on the on the benches at Merrifield. Lovely plant, and it is just one of the very late Korean mums, and they bloom so late that some of them actually don't set buds until the first of November. So this would be October going just into November, and this one I like, um, it's probably my favorite just because it's, it's so upright. It holds itself up very, very nicely. Um, the other thing is the grasses, which will come into season as we progress into fall. So here we see molly, the pink molly grass, and we actually sell the, the white molly grass, which they're fabulous, and put them with a perennial. Uh, even put them with an annual or some of the seasonal flower, and you have a great display. So these are just lovely grasses, These and they're three feet tall, sun lovers, um, native to the United States, but a more southern climate. Um, and they, they, they generally winter over fine, um, although last winter some people did have some problems with them, but that was an exceptionally bad winter. So molly, we move from molly grass still into 
the chrysanthemum Sheffield. And here you see it very late in the season with one of my favorite perennials is Euphorbia blackbird, which is a actually evergreen uh, Euphorbia with the dark, dark foliage. And in the foreground is uh, a different Euphorbia called Diamond Frost, which is an annual. But what a wonderful display to have for October. I mean, that's just fabulous. Again, you see how nice and floriferous that chrysanthemum is. It's a lovely pinkish salmon shade. So I just, again, I'm, I'm crazy about that one, but we do have quite a few different varieties of the Korean mumps in the perennial section at Fair Oaks. Uh, and I did want to talk about, uh, we'll have our bulbs. They'll be coming in very soon. Oh, this is the last one of Sheffield. Aster Raiden's favorite blooms with chrysanthemum Sheffield. It's as easy as that. And it's a little bit taller by about a foot. So when you put these two together, uh, you ha always have this wonderful fall display. Now it needs full sun. These both need a lot of sun, but um, put them together and you'll always be happy with your, your late fall garden. I mean, it's just fabulous. Isn't that fabulous? Oh, it's spectacular. Yeah. Um, but before we leave the uh, chrysanthemums, I just kind of want to make sure uh, we're clear on this. So you're saying like the cushion mums, uh -huh. those there, when you say pinched back, they're pruned a few times during the growing season. So you get those dense, tight right. uh, forms, beautiful flowers. And they may, right, my, I mean, customers are telling they may or may not survive through the winter time. I mean, we sell them as a seasonal color for you know, annuals. I, when I had my own nursery, we used to, to plant chrysanthemums in the field and we would dig them. And, and at the last point, we were doing 5,000. They used to be perennial. They used to be hardy. We sold right. them as hardy perennials. There was not a problem, but I, I, I believe it was the hybridization and these new colors where we exactly. started to be peaches and things that were not absolutely normal for chrysanthemum. It was like they introduced sort of a non, maybe a, a non-hardy line. We, we started to see that they were not hardy. Uh, but the other thing is that the pinching, they will try to bloom in the summer. So right. the pinching is sort of necessary. And for our latitude, I've always understood that we want to pinch them middle of June, middle of July, and middle of August. Right, but and, then you look at the Sheffield types. And then types. be done. And then you don't They're, have to those do those are, Koreans. Those are tough as nails. You, you absolutely can do them, and it will make them shorter, but it will make them so short, actually, that, that sometimes you don't want to pinch them. But they bloom naturally late without that need for pinching. Yeah. Because yeah. I know the other day we were trying to help, I was trying to help a customer explain, and I like the way you were explaining the Korean moms, and you just said, well, they're just better. They're better. <laughs> but that's your bias yeah. opinion there, right? Depends on real, really yeah. whether you look for seasonal color. And on, and, the, on and the pinching, I've got it wrong. So you do May, June, July, and your last date for pinching them back is like July 15th for our latitude. And that will have them blooming generally September, uh, which I, you know, any time from September on. There's earlier varieties, there's later varieties. But you do need to work with those, the cushion mums and pinch them back, whereas the cream mums you don't. So, you know, it's hard to argue with that, right? Right. <laughs> now, as you mentioned, the bulbs are coming in also. Yes. I mean, we already have things like yes. the iris and the fall crocus on the shelf, and some of our uh, other bulbs are just coming in the warehouse and haven't made it on display. Right, and this is a hardy cyclamen. It's, it's small, it's only like six inches tall, but boy is it lovely in the garden. Not only is it nice because of a bloom time, which is August, September, for heterofolium, but the foliage is there all winter long, and here's, the, here's what the foliage looks like. And they're really, that's our next slide, and the foliage is there all winter. And the thing is they go dormant for the summer, then they flower, and then the leaves come after the flower. So you can put them someplace where the trees lose their leaves, where you have deciduous trees. They really don't want full sun. They really want that place where they can have light during the winter. That's the most important thing for them. That's their survival strategy uh, because they're going to be under trees. But as long as these trees aren't evergreen, uh, they'll do fine, and they're, they're small little bulbs that you'll buy, and they'll be ready probably in a week as far as availability goes in order for you to come and pick them up. So I just love them. I have hundreds and hundreds of them in my garden. Oh, excellent. Well, we're going to have to take another commercial break, but uh, stay with us, and we've got another segment ahead of Plants for Your uh, That You Must Have list. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, we've been talking about flowers for late summer bloom, and as we said, we're in that sort of transition time. So, a lot of your, I think, your summer annuals and things that, you know, might be looking glorious now, but you're yeah. kind of looking ahead to the next season. It's uh, hard, yeah. You know, we will kind of sort of talk about some things we can do to really make the yeah. best of our fall season here. Right, and so, you know, fall is a season. I, I, I think gardeners get tired of the whole season and they don't take as much, much advantage of fall as they should, especially in containers. Um, and so we get another fall, another season like spring that is pretty long for us. It's great. It goes sometimes all the way up into early December. Um, you know, some of these plants can take light frost. When you go to Merrifield, you'll find these fall magic um, signs and there you will find plants that will tolerate quite a bit of cool. And that's where you want to go to sort of um, think about, we will get frost, we will have our summer annuals, our warm season plants suffer when the nights start to get into uh, the low 50s and 40s. So you want to think about planting or getting ready to do some of this fall stuff and there's just lovely things that can go with light frost. Um, Nemesia is just one plant and Nemesia is um, really, this is a sort of deceptive beautiful photograph that I that I took <laughs> but it's a small flower so you know don't be deceived by that but there's so many others like it that you can do whole arrangements in containers or even you know spiff up your garden beds and and we will you know, generally we get back into rainy seasons we have regular rains so you know don't don't give up the garden uh, take advantage of the fact that we have such a long fall season Right, and I think that's what I'm always, always emphasizing is it's, you know, it was 90 degrees hot and humid last, uh -huh. yesterday and today, and then the last thing you're thinking, here you are talking about yeah. cool temperatures, fall, freezing temperatures, but I really think the biggest key to success in gardening is that, is looking ahead, is that sort of planning ahead. Oh, no, ahead we, and gardeners do, decisions. yeah. Right. We don't uh, plant a bulb without thinking of spring. Exactly. So it's just that time. That's yeah. why I, I just, I like the fact you're saying thinking, thinking, planning. It's, yeah. uh, you know, some people are getting started now, but, yeah. you know, whether it's now, next week, the following week, you know, we're in that time period well, to and make we, the transition. In the industry, we had to be ahead of you. So, you know, we're, we're telling you, we're ready. <laughs> right, so you'll find those fall magic displays coming uh -huh. out in this yeah. annuals like Nemesia. Yeah, and here's the Nemesia. Uh, here's a small. And know, I love this is even, what I'm talking about. even plants like this, uh, Calibrico, we bring in yeah. just because it has even the fall colors. So and we, it can we take like light to, frost and it will go for a very long exactly. time. Exactly, we love to see those oranges and yellows and, and yeah. burgundies and colors that are out there. So they're a mix of annuals and perennials. Yeah, and right, exactly. Things that just blend well together and, for and that speaking, season ahead. Speaking of perennials, we do have one that we can show you, which is Serratostigma or Plumbago, uh, which has the blue flowers in the fall. And then it gets lovely coloring to the leaf. Um, this is a ground cover, this is perennial, and it's so nice to have blue, which is really a lovely blue. And it's, a, it's really better planted in partial sun. Uh, that's what it prefers, although people do plant it sometimes in full sun, but I find it really a much better plant in partial sun. A pretty prolonged bloom time, but really wonderful with that foliage as it, as it turns. It spreads by rhizome, so it does become a ground cover, so you want to kind of give it room to, to sprawl and to spread. And it's short, it's only, it's only six to eight inches tall. But it's great to have that kind of color, you know, and it starts, it's starting already, and it will go, you know, August and into September, and then get that wonderful color to the leaf. And it's not always just about flowers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like I like say the cool seasons had, you know, Swiss chard, which um, a lot of us know is uh, from our kitchens and everything. Right. Uh, you know, in the, it's uh, actually it's related to beets and same group of plants. This, um, a lot of times they've moved towards developing uh, plants that also gives a lot of ornamental value. Yeah, and that's really beautiful with that fire hydrant. Yeah, I took this picture down at American University. I just thought it was a very novel use of the plant. Uh, you know, I love the color combination with the fire hydrant there. And, you know, normally something that you would think of as sort of a, a little bit of an eyesore, they actually incorporate it in there with mm -hmm. their color scheme. Uh, you can't see it real well, but there's some salvia that's going to come up and give it a lot of contrasting purple and 
late summer and a little bit of Russian sage in the background. So I thought, what a great, great use. Took this little island, you might say, it's surrounded with uh -huh. concrete and everything and turned it into something pretty. But these, um, the, the chard, you know, is definitely a plant that takes uh, cold temperatures. And, and these are edible as well. It's just that uh, some of them developed you know, specifically for excellent production and taste, and then others have been developed, you know, again, with that nice colorful stem that's in there. More for ornament. Exactly. So yeah. there's also, there's cabbages and kales and other uh, plants we brought in as an ornamental. Right, but, yeah, and this is a kale that's been sold for a few years now. I remember when it first kind of popped up on the scene as, as kale red bore, is that very purple uh, curly leaf. An amazing plant, um, more ornamental than than edible, and this is up at Chanticleer Gardens uh, a couple years ago. They've done this garden and laid it out with corn and beans and done all kinds of different things as far as that, that big swath of, of, of plantings. But the kale, I, I was curious last year with the winter that we had if red boar could take the winter, and believe it or not, it actually survived the winter which is amazing, Mo you know, so many of the fall vegetables will go a very, very, very long time, like lettuce and things, but then we'll get a freeze that will knock them out. But that red boar kale is amazing. Yeah, and sometimes we'll even weave them through in spring and that puts up the big flower spike, the which is, which I, is attractive. I used, to, I used to plant them with my peonies because that big yellow spray of flowers comes out when the peonies are blooming. It's a great combination. So red yeah. boar with your peonies. And one more before we go to commercial break is this roos tiger eye, which I talked about this early on in one of the shows, and this is it in early November. Yeah, so we're just Amazing. kind of, a bit of a teaser telling you falls ahead, and we're gonna get the beautiful foliage and everything, so get ready now. Well, we're going to, um, when we come back, we're gonna open up the phones. We would love to hear from you with any questions, comments, uh, anything at all. So our phone number there is going to be at 703- <laughs> 387-1046. Uh, please give us a call and we look forward to hearing from you when we come back. Good morning, everybody. This is a part of the show where we get to hear from you, so please give us a call. Uh, that's 703-387-1046. And we already have our first caller in line from Colesville, Maryland. Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, David, and uh, I hope you and Karen are doing well also. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So how can we help you? Uh, I have had some beautiful amaryllis last winter. They blossomed beautifully. And to care for them, I thought I would take them out uh, where I could keep them watered until the straps died down and the straps never died down. Uh, now I'm beginning to wonder what's going to happen this fall because they're, they're, they're looking good. Are they going to blossom with those straps or should I stop watering? How about that? Good question. I'm mm -hmm. sure several people are wondering how, what to do with their amaryllis. You know, it's easy. Um, I, by the straps, you mean the leaves. So I, I always treat them like a house plant and I let them keep their leaves and I will very often plant them in the ground for the summer months because then they get so much bigger. And then when I bring them in, they will naturally bloom and it's generally late. So um, I don't worry about it. I keep them growing. I don't remove leaves. I don't put them in the dark. I don't take away the water. I just treat them like a house plant and I just keep watering them and taking care of them that way. And I have big, big plants that I dig in when it gets cold, as it gets, starts to get a little chilly and I bring them in and they're fabulous. They have so many flowers. It's just a, you know, it's just an easy, easy plant to care for really. And you don't need to worry, they will still flower. Excellent. Well, good luck with that, Richard. That sounds um, simple. Like exactly. Yeah. Make, well, yeah. And it should be easy. Gardening is simple. Great. Well, we're going to move on to our next caller now, who is Ann calling in from Springfield. Good morning. How are you doing today, Ann? Uh, let's see. Our phone's working there. Ann, are you there? I am, yes. Oh, okay, good. How are you doing? How can we help you? Good, thank you. I have a couple of questions. One is for my boxwood hedge. Can I take about a foot off that now? It's Cut probably it. not a good idea, Ann. Uh, with box, what we found, if you do that, if you trim them now in, in late August, 
they start regrowing into September, mm -hmm. then the cold weather comes and browns all that foliage. So really, uh, I'm going to ask that you kind of hold off and, and attempt that next spring, usually around you know, maybe March time period, very first part of April, just before the growth begins. Okay, thank okay, you. Okay, so hands yep. off the boxwoods. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Great. The other one is, um, I, ha I used to have an iris bed years and years ago, and I went and dug everything up because I was going to refresh the whole bed. It was full of um, daffodils and everything. Well, I got all mixed up. I didn't know what bulb was what, and now I have nothing in that bed, and I want to start again. So I want to do a whole bed of irises alone. And how do I get all my annuals and, and other perennials in on top of those bulbs? When is the time to do oh, that? Excellent. A clean slate to start with yeah. here. So you can do you can do your irises with with all of those other things. That's not a problem. Um, the irises growing period is very strong in the spring, and then they bloom. And you buy them now because they're about to put out roots. The end of August is when they put out roots. So you go and you can buy them now as bare root. And what's lovely is we have the rebloomers, so you can get the varieties that bloom spring and fall. But you can put them in the bed, and in the summer, they're sort of not actually growing. So you can have all kinds of growing things with them. As long as you sort of edit or clean those back so that the iris leaves get sun and light this time of year as they go into a second spurt of growth. So you can easily do the irises with the annuals or with the daffodils or with perennials that can all work together in the flower bed. It's, it's, um, you just have to do a little bit of editing in the fall so that you're allowing the iris to get light again when they start growing strong because they need that to produce the buds for spring. So. Oh, thank you. That's been so helpful to me. Excellent. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, Ann. Well, we'll be looking for you at the Garden Center today because that's the project you can start with right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. And Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And let's see, and I have Joan on the line, calling in from uh, Oxen Hill. How are you doing today, Joan? Pretty good. How about you? Oh, fantastic. Good. And what's My your question? My question was, is it too late to plant things like kale? And what other winter crops could be planted down? Or, or can they? No, your timing is perfect. perfect. Actually. Karen and I had this in our schedule to talk about today, but then um, yeah. it turns out Peggy's going to be doing a whole program on this next week, and we had a limited amount of time. But, okay. but but we can give you a quick answer here. What can we plant now? Oh, my gosh. Um, September 1st is usually when I put out lettuce, but you can do definitely do the kale. There's leeks. There's all kinds of things for sale, carrots. I mean, in market packs, we have all kinds of stuff. So it's definitely time to think about it and definitely time to get started. And your timing is perfect. Are these, are these uh, pre-started or are they by yes. seed? And next kale, you, I know, is seed. Well, you can you can buy the plants as well, but next week the whole show will be on this topic. So if you're if you're confused about it, you know, watch the show next week. But know that you can go and buy these plants now. We definitely have them, and it's time to get started on so many of those cool season crops. You know, even even peas, snow peas. I mean, it's just oh, a great really? time. Yes, for fall we have a, such a nice long fall here in Virginia. You really should take advantage of it, or in Maryland. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, and that's, yeah. I think, is a lot of times people wait too long to get started exactly. on that. Exactly, So that's yes. why it's so perfect you called about this, yes. and, and we're going to have lots more detail. But yes, you can start on that now. Okay. Oh, well, we're going we're gonna to have to take a commercial break uh, right now, but please stay with us, because when we come back, we look forward to hearing from more of you with more gardening questions. We're going to get right back to our phone calls. And Michael, thanks for holding. How can we help you? Hi, we've been here for about three years um, working with our yard, trying to get the grass to grow. And in the spring, it looks beautiful. But it appears that we are over shale rock. As I try and plant trees and everything, I'm always digging out the rock. My question is, in preparation for this fall, we'd like to get some sort of topsoil or something to put on top of the soil to help the roots grow better. Right. Interested in finding out 
what do you recommend as far as the amount and uh, you know half inch inch what, what do you have right so you're talking about just top dressing over your existing lawn you're not doing a total renovation or anything is that correct correct top yeah. dressing and reseeding yeah uh, again I feel like we can get started on that anytime typically we don't do this till September and, and we'll be addressing this in September with the cool weather and the rainfall I feel like really uh, kind of been starting to give people the green light to go for this anytime building your soil doesn't happen instantly uh, it's something it does take time to develop but you're 100 percent on the right track there I like to do a combination of aerating and then we top dress about a rate of one cubic yard per thousand square feet. If you do this one yard per thousand square feet, that's going to be a very thin layer. We're talking about it's less than half of an inch thick. But if each year you sort of top dress and aerate, top dress and aerate, top dress and aerate, if you do this for about two, three years, then you really start to see significant improvement in there. Uh, the product that we most often recommend and use is called McGill's Compost. Uh, it is, does have the biosolids in it, so it can be a little smelly when you put it down, so that's quite, kind of alerts you to that. Uh, but it's great for your lawn. Uh, we also sell a product called Soil Mate, which does not have the biosolids or the smell, but it's not as nutrient rich either. So really, you can use either one of them, but it's this um, McGill's compost at a rate of about one cubic yard per thousand square feet. Now that's for lawns. I don't know if you had anything to no, I'm add all, in there. Yeah, the compost is always seems to be the answer to help with shale, especially. That's tough. Right. Yeah. So. But uh, it takes a little stick to itness. You'll see improvement right away. But if you do this over a few times over a few years, uh, it's amazing. I had a customer in yesterday said she's been doing this for five years now, and went out there and stuck her trowel in there and was yeah. able to go down four or five inches. Lovely. She's just all excited and yeah. amazed about it. I said, yeah. she should be. It, she should be right. It, it takes time. That's but but uh, good question. Amazing to hear because uh, right now you can't get a shovel at more than half inch before you're oh. hitting rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we both have uh, well lived near Haymarket and know yes. exactly what you're dealing with. It can be done, but it, it takes a little time and effort. Well, thank you very much. Our uh, flower beds look great from the all the great tips we've received from you all. All right. Appreciate that. Now we're just trying to uh, dress up the yard, and we'll uh, try that and uh, do some overseeding this year in aeration. Good. Thank you. And, and we'll be talking about that, and I'm excited. To get, it's still about a month away, but I've got Dr. Goatley from Virginia Tech coming to oh, talk cool. to us about turf. Excellent. Great. Excellent. Well, our time's limited here, so let's move on to our next caller, Ed, who's calling in with questions about camellias. Yes. Uh, uh, my fall and spring blooming camellias, and uh, my question is, uh, uh, I have some fall blooming camellias and they've set buds already. I have another group that have not set any buds. And my question is, uh, is there still time in the season for those that don't have uh, their buds set so far? Uh, will they still show up uh, and bloom this fall? And on the other hand, the spring blooming ones, I have some buds on those and I have other plants that do not. So that's my question. Am I too late this year? Has the cold winter done something to some of those? That's a good question. I'm going to just um, sort of jump in and then hear what Karen has to say. Typically, I do expect to see bud setting right about now in this late August time period. Um, now, I will tell you, my, my camellia got severely damaged by the fall, had to be cut back to almost nothing and I don't see any buds forming on it. So I'm thinking there might be some plants that are gonna be delayed from the winter damage. Yeah, I but imagine. I don't, I don't know if you're growing camellias or have I, anything. I'm not, but I, on. you know, and I work in perennials, I don't work in trees and shrubs, but I, I go out into trees and shrubs because I'm curious about everything. And I've noticed that there's buds already set on many, many, many things. So, you know, that would definitely be normal, but I wouldn't know what to say or do necessarily about those that have um, that you're worried about in the future. Yeah, I think Ed, what we're doing is it's going to be a little bit of a learning experience for all of us because yeah. this was like the coldest winter that we've had in 20, 25 years yeah. or something, and yeah. uh, so I think we're all sort of learning as we go through it. But uh, my guess is that uh, sort of late August, early September is the time for bud set. If it mm -hmm. doesn't happen in the next two, three weeks, then it's not going to happen. And 
I would attribute that to the winter damage. So it's just mm -hmm. going to be a wait and see. I don't think that there's any little tricks or anything you can do to change the outcome at this point yeah. in time. I, I'm afraid uh, I can see just tiny little growth on the tips. It, it just doesn't look like they're going to make it, you know. Yeah. So, okay, well, thanks for taking my question and thanks for having your program. Yeah. And if it's any consolation, I have one camellia, and I don't see any buds forming yeah. there either. Yeah. So I think it might be a little disappointment for uh, some of us. You there. know, with a lot of things, we're just going to have to uh, go to next year on. That, that's yes, it. Exactly. Yeah. And hope we do okay this winter. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for one more caller here. Uh, Betsy's calling in from Gaithersburg. And how are you doing today, Betsy? Fine, thank you. My question is about getting rid of wisteria. No. Oh. Mm. Oh. Do we want to just move on? <laughs> it's no. hard. Yeah. Uh, wisteria, I, a lot of times when I talk about these really tough, aggressive plants, I talk about war of attrition in a sense. Exactly, starvation, starve it. Right. Part, you know, dig out what you can, it's tough. Great. So, starve it, starve it, starve it. Yeah, Don't so let it have any green leaves. It gets up sprout, cut it off. Yeah. It works wonders. Great. So we're about to run out of time, but I really quick want to say, Betsy, there's a product called um, Stump and Vine Killer. Mm. Uh, you can use that along with cutting and chopping and digging, yeah. and it's just going to be a war of attrition. So that's a tough one. But come in and talk to us about the stump and vine killer and give you a little more guidance. And I'm sorry we're getting that they're going to pull the plug on us here, All so right. we're going to have to go real quick. Uh, now, next week, Peggy's going to be here. Mm -hmm. She's going to be talking to you about all the wonderful vegetables that mm -hmm. you can plant for fall. So we appreciate uh, you being here today with thank us, you. Karen. And thank all of you for being with us today. And definitely watch next week as we talk about planting those fall vegetables.